everyone and welcome to the Global Rhodes Alumni live stream. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm Elizabeth Keish. I am the new uh, warden of Rhodes House and I have the great pleasure today of being interviewed. They will actually be sharing questions that you all have sent in and that they have gathered from the from the Rhodes Scholar community by Aaron Frazier and Saul Musker. And Aaron, they're both 2017 Rhodes Scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron is from Maryland, D.C. Yes. And uh, has finished an MSc in U.S. History and is mm -hmm. starting a MSc in International and Comparative Education. Do yes. I have that more or less right? Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> um, and Saul is from is South Africa at large. and. Uh, uh, completed an MSc last year in global governance and is starting a master's of public policy. So exactly. um, thank you both for, for, for joining, uh, joining me for this live stream and I, I look forward to your questions. Yeah. It's very nice to be on this side of an interview for once. <laughs> yes, <laughs> revenge. <laughs> yeah, well um, with that I've got one to start us out with. Great. So what has it been like coming back to Oxford um, and starting in this new role in what were Oxford and Rhodes House like when you attended and how have they changed for better and for worse? Sure, great. Um, so, you know, I was, I was uh, elected a Rhodes Scholar in 1983, so mm -hmm. quite a while ago, although it sort of seems like yesterday, uh, especially when I'm walking around Oxford today. So, you know, it, Oxford was, and the Rhodes was a transformative experience for me. It was absolutely wonderful. But Rhodes House itself, was a very quiet place uh, when, when I was a Rhodes Scholar. We, I, I remember maybe two times going to Rhodes House, very different from today um, in terms of all the programming and all the ways in which we are a vibrant community uh, at Rhodes House. So that is a big change, mm -hmm. and it's one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be, uh, to be joining uh, Rhodes House. Um, and, the, and the university has, uh, changed in a lot of ways as well. Many more women in leadership roles, mm -hmm. including the vice chancellor. Uh, there's much more, I think, going on in the sciences than there mm -hmm. was in the in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. But then, of course, there are the great continuities of Oxford. It's just as beautiful now as it was then. Absolutely. Thank you. Staying on the theme of change, mm -hmm. one alumnus asks, where else might the Rhodes scholarships expand to? Because, of, of course, in recent years, the scholarship has expanded to new constituencies in Africa and elsewhere in the world, and we have the new global scholarships as well. Yes. So perhaps you could speak to that a little bit and, and speak to what's next, too. Sure. Great. Yes. No, it's, uh, it's been very exciting to see this expansion to China, to Israel, Palestine, uh, West Africa. I'll be going to Rwanda next month to participate in the selection of our first East African uh, Rhodes Scholar. Um, so all of that is very exciting and we're really in the in the midst right now of figuring out where we expand to next. And uh, so we're, we're working on a strategy, a kind of five to ten year strategy, and we'll be sharing that with uh, uh, with actually the whole alumni community and the, and the and with current scholars in the coming months. But kind of what's emerging, I think, as, as, I, as I've been thinking about it and talking to people is, is, you know, how do we take the next step towards being a truly global scholarship? Um, how, and I think we, we, we may end up with a strong focus on the global south, um, and that would include, you know, Southeast Asia, more scholarships from Africa. I would love to have more scholarships from Africa. And we have none at the moment from Latin America. And it's interesting that uh, for the new global scholarship, we had more applicants from Brazil than any other country. So mm -hmm. that's also sort of pointing to Latin America being a, 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 a place that we, we should be exploring. So we'll be kind of establishing some goals and priorities in the coming months, but uh, expansion is definitely a continued priority. Do you think that your model will be to continue to expand the global scholarships or to add new constituencies as in the past? Yeah, it's a great mm -hmm. question, Saul. And, I, and there are kind of pros and cons for both sides. Uh, there is something about having a constituency where you can, you know, you can ultimately have an alumni group. Right. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, there's, there's, you can have people who understand the local context. And I think all of that is a really important part of, of constituency-based expansion. At the same time, there is something wonderful about saying to any student from anywhere in the world, 
you can be a Rhodes Scholar. So I suspect we'll end up with a, a kind of a both and strategy, um, but exactly how far we'll expand the global, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, we only have two in this initial round. I'd love to see, you know, someday five, someday maybe 10. Uh, but I, I guess I'm, my sense is that our core will remain constituency-based, you know, because there is something very valuable about that. Absolutely. <clears throat> and so this talk of expansion is sort of a very different conversation mm -hmm. than one that might have been happening in, say, 2008, 2009. Yes. Uh, following the global financial crisis, a large focus of Rhodes House has been solidifying the sustainability of the trust. Yes. Um, but these efforts were largely successful, right? That's why we can talk expansion now. So what do you see as the Rhodes mission uh, past financial viability? Yeah, that's great. I mean, it's, it, was a, it was truly a heroic effort uh, by you know, my predecessor, Charles Kahn, and the trustees, and many, many Rhodes Scholars. Over half of living Rhodes Scholars contributed to the campaign that, that stabilized the finances of the, of the trust. And so now, as we look to the future, uh, we're really looking at, you know, we do have to, I should say, we do have to continue to seek uh, uh, gifts from scholars, and, and I really hope that the scholar community will continue to contribute, but it will be much more focused on uh, supporting the, the scholar experience. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it, it, and I think the two of you can, can really relate to this, uh, as can really anyone who's looked at the economics of higher education, is mm -hmm. that you know, the cost, uh, the costs do go up, and, you know, we have been modestly increasing the stipend year over year, but particularly as we continue to diversify the, the Rhodes Scholarship, we know that there are financial stresses for our scholars. Um, costs go up of visas, of health care, lots of things. So what we're going to really be doing in the, in the, the coming months and years is is framing the request for support very much in terms of supporting scholars so that people can get a real sense of how you know, the dollar or the pound or whatever that I give um, is directly going to, to support scholars, to helping those who are experiencing hardship, to enhancing the scholar experience. So that's a very important kind of continued mission for the, for the, the trust. The other piece, which I'm very excited about, um, again, building on what's been done over the, the last five, ten years, is, is, is thinking about how do we focus on this, the arc of the scholar experience, you know, all the way from selection, outreach selection through the, you know, what is, what is the shared experience for every Rhodes Scholar, the, the character service leadership program that has become such an important part of what it means to be a Rhodes Scholar, and continuing to refine that and then to really look at lifelong fellowship, you know, um, alumni engagement, giving alumni opportunities to convene both around the world and here at Rhodes House. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's also a part of the, you know, as we look to the future, is how do we build this into a, an impactful, connected network uh, that is a lifelong fellowship of, of Rhodes Scholars. We actually had a question from a senior scholar mm -hmm. on, on that point. Um, and they asked whether Rhodes House has some ideas about involving alumni at Rhodes House after they've left Oxford. Mm -hmm. So for example, by coming back to spend a term at Rhodes House, mm -hmm. mentoring current Rhodes Scholars, speaking, um, engaging with the trust in that way. Do you, do you think that that might be possible someday? Absolutely, and I, I think I really love that idea. And, uh, and actually, we have been looking at this notion of a possibly a senior scholarship for someone to come back and spend a term or a year um, in residence at Rhodes House. So it's certainly an idea that's kind of in the hopper as we think about uh, how we, um, how, you know, this, how do we give life to this notion of lifelong fellowship and how do we engage alumni. In terms of mentors, uh, that's also something where there's already been some great work done. Um, you know, it, uh, if you come to one of our convenings, for example, we, we have senior scholars or alumni and others uh, who come to convenings and we will have mentoring sessions. And um, I'm really looking at uh, uh, how do we 
formalize that in some ways um, and make it possible for more alumni who are interested in becoming mentors to connect. Uh, we're we're uh, continuing to refine our digital uh, strategies and we'll be doing a, a big focus on updating our, our digital platform at Rhodes House in the next couple of years. And so making it possible for people you know, like Aaron, you're interested in education. Mm -hmm. We have an amazing um, network, but they're not connected, of alumni who care about education and educational access. How do we make it easier for people who share the same passion or interest to connect to one another, to, to mentor one another, to help one another and support one another? So yes, that's definitely, uh, I, I love that idea and I encourage people to send in more ideas because they'll all be put in the hopper as we as we create this strategic plan. Absolutely. I want to stay on the mission of the scholarships, which yes. we've been speaking about. When Cecil Rhodes established the scholarship, mm -hmm. he had the sort of grotesque colonial mission of expanding the empire. Mm -hmm. And now in the 21st century, how would you capture the contemporary mission of the trust. Do you think that there is a single purpose for the scholarships? Is there a single thing you want scholars to go out and do mm. in the world? Or do you think that we're, we've entered a different kind of era? Yes, no, I, I think for, and this is actually one of the reasons why I was so drawn to, to coming back to Rhodes House, is that I think we live in a world where there are so many forces that are pulling people apart. Um, there's, you know, rising nationalism and xenophobia. There's kind of fraying of international frameworks and of, of uh, kind of multilateral uh, arrangements uh, around the world. And so I think, it, I think the vision of bringing a very diverse group of talented young people together um, to, to create a community and to learn from each other and to to develop leaders, and it's not you know, leaders of a particular type, right? And one of the things I, I really believe passionately is that there's no one way a Rhodes Scholar is supposed to lead, right? right. Uh, you know, it's a very cross-disciplinary, diverse vision of leadership. But for all of those, uh, all of our leaders to be people who are um, curious about those from different backgrounds from themselves, experienced in that kind of cross-cultural community building, um, is, and, and committed to an ongoing, a lifelong process of thinking about what do I stand for? How can I make the world a better place? Whatever my field of endeavor is, how can I make a difference and how can I fight the world's fight? So I think in that sense, there are still some strands from the original vision that are very relevant, um, but it is a much more diverse and global and, and I hope inclusive vision than it was originally. Right. Absolutely. I think, uh, I was going to ask you this a bit later, but it, I think you've sort of flowed pretty directly into it. Um, and there's sort of a constant debate within Rhodes House and on uh, college campuses about sort of the difference between going into a more public or nonprofit space mm -hmm. versus a private corporate space. Um, how do you see people being able, I mean, sort of more tangible, in a more tangible respect, to fight the world's fight from within corporations that, um, though, you know, have, for example, social responsibility departments, mm -hmm. uh, often exacerbate rather than alleviate inequality? And then the flip side of that is how without the capital and the resources that large conglomerates have, can people really make change in those public nonprofit spaces and similarly fight the world's fight? Yes, no, I, it's a great question and I think it is very much on a lot of scholars' minds mm -hmm. and I, as I've been traveling around and meeting particularly with some young alumni, I mm -hmm. know it's, a, it's kind of a struggle, you know, so, you know, are there right and wrong ways, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, uh, to fight the world's fight? And I feel really passionately about uh, the, the value of uh, Rhodes Scholars in every sector. You know, we want Rhodes Scholars to be business leaders. We want them to be entrepreneurs, to be NGO leaders, to be artists, to be writers, to be journalists, to be scientists. It's actually one of the things that makes the Rhodes Scholarship um, so powerful, I think. If you look at the impact that Rhodes Scholars historically have had on the world, 
part of the reason for that impact is because they have been in, you know, across the, the many, many fields of endeavor. So I, I want to encourage people to think, you know, what is it that gives me joy? Where do my talents, uh, you know, where do my talents lie? And, and also, what do I want to do across my whole life? You know, because, you, you, you know, people, we know that over the course of a career, we'll do a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So some people will end up going into um, a large corporation and, and then do amazing things either within that corporation mm -hmm. to open doors for others, but also in their philanthropy or in their mm -hmm. civic engagement. Others will be, you know, uh, kind of advocates, uh, very kind of... Uh, um, from the ground up, but it's mm -hmm. important for them to have connections to people, you know, with uh, with resources. So, so there's so many ways to do this, and I and I, you know, I always want to resist the notion that there are right and wrong ways. I think this is a question that people have to answer for themselves. There's no one right answer, and they also have to answer it and be kind of curious and thoughtful about it across their whole lifetimes because mm -hmm. there are there will be different doors that open and uh, different opportunities all the way along. I know that as a South African scholar there sometimes seems to be a tension between the expectation that one should go back to one's constituency mm -hmm. and effect change there, give back, and the notion that one could contribute globally and fight the world's fight. Yes. Um, do you think that that is a tension or? I think it is a tension. I think it is something that um, I think it's important for people to be comfortable talking about it. Uh, but I, you know, again, there again, I feel like there is no one right answer. You know, you um, I, I know, you know, take an example of a of a South African Rhodes Scholar, Kumi Naidu, who is now the head of Amnesty International. Right. You know, and I know he has uh, he has said uh, that. Um, he cares passionately about issues in Africa, but you know his platform first at Greenpeace and then at at Amnesty International was was from a different you know I mean he's not based literally in in um, South Africa, but he's he's alive to and interested in those issues. I know a number of South African Rhodes Scholars who may be living in other parts of the world, but are you know continue to be connected with with issues in their in their uh, home country. So. So there again, I think it's, it, it's, there's no single right answer. Um, and, and I also think that uh, every scholar needs to figure out, you know, what's the way in which I, in particular, with my interests, my skills, my talents, I can make a difference in the world. We have one question from an, an alumnus about a particular global issue, yes. which is environmentalism. Yes. And, and this senior scholar asks, Given the 2017 climate change event at Rhodes House and also the upcoming Schwarzman Rhodes Symposium on public leadership, um, when leadership is discussed, does it also include environmental leadership? And how much focus is Rhodes House placing on the environment? Yes, it's a great question. And I actually hope that we can do another convening on climate change sometime in the next, uh, in the next couple of years. You know, as we've looked at... Um, the ways in which we engage with scholars around character service leadership uh, with our wonderful Dean of Leadership and Change, Nadia Figueroa, uh, we, a, a, you know, as, as she and her um, co-designers have looked at, you know, what is it that we really want to get scholars to think about? What's the arc of the issues? It, it, it kind of crystallizes around self, you know, thinking about understanding your values and your uh, your principles and your commitments, your shadow side, all of those sorts of things. It's community. What kind of community do you want to build initially among Rhodes Scholars, but then also in the larger world? And then it's the world. Mm -hmm. And within that, actually within all three of those, but especially in our kind of obligations to the world, um, uh, non-human nature and this, this fragile planet in terms of, of its ability to sustain human civilization is a really, really important topic. And, you know, we do have some, um, thanks to some uh, wonderfully generous uh, senior scholars, there are grants that are available specifically to people, to scholars who want to work on environmental issues. Uh, we've recently had a group of scholars go to Patagonia uh, mm -hmm. with a very strong focus there on 
on thinking about climate change and, and nature. So yes, I, I really think that um, as we think about some of the major global challenges that we hope many scholars will want to focus on, one of them is certainly uh, the cli climate change and the environment. Absolutely. So another question, this one from an Australian senior scholar, mm -hmm. um, and they're basically getting at the idea that winning the Rhodes Scholarship is often a highlight achievement of, of one's certainly young adult life, mm -hmm. um, but there's no certificate or sort of diploma or degree of sorts, something that can be framed. Um, and it seems to them unfortunate that Rhodes Scholars lack an official document of any kind to represent um, in later life. Uh, is that something that Rhodes House is thinking about changing? I think it's a great idea, actually. Uh, and I think it's something we can make happen, for sure. Uh, we, um, we actually have been also experimenting, or not experimenting, but have been sort of piloting, I guess, um, a, a certificate for those who are called for interviews, so mm -hmm. finalists, which I think is also, it's, it's also a nice thing for somebody to receive. But I love the idea mm -hmm. of, a, of, a, of a nice certificate that, um, that once a scholar-elect is like, confirmed, they've been admitted to Oxford and you know, college and a program, they would receive not only a letter from us saying, you know, it's official, uh, but they would also receive a, a nice certificate. So mm -hmm. great idea. We can make that happen. And very nice paper. Yeah, very nice paper, <laughs> yes. You know, with Rhodes Blue, um, hopefully. Absolutely, <laughs> like the three of us. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> very on brand. <laughs> and so, given not just the internally historic nature of your appointment, mm. but also the current political climate regarding a reinvigorated push for gender justice and fairness, yes. uh, what does it mean to you to be the first woman appointed as the warden of Rhodes House? You know, it's such an incredible honor. I mean, it really is. Um, it means it means the world to me, actually. You know, I, as I, I've been reflecting on this, that you know, at the time that I was elected as a Rhodes Scholar, which was just a few years after the scholarship was a, was expanded to admit women, um, I you know I would I would not have thought about could I ever be you know warden, and it it, it also makes me really think about all of the people, um, Rhodes Scholars and trustees, who, who fought that fight, you know, because it was not a simple thing to, to get an act of parliament to change the, the will, so to speak, or to allow the trustees to, um, to open the scholarship for, for women. And so I'm deeply grateful to all of those people. And I know it took, you know, years of, of deliberations and strategizing and everything. And, and so it is a, it, it, you know, that was an opening of a door, and I feel like um, uh, my appointment is, is again, uh, is, is opening a door, and there will be many more, you know, to come of, of, uh, uh, of you know, uh, new, new generations of Rhodes Scholars stepping into leadership roles, um, and it's very exciting to me. So I really see myself as part of this historical trajectory. Um, and with a real responsibility uh, to, to pay attention to how do we continue that work mm -hmm. of uh, making the scholarship open to uh, more and more young people of every background, uh, of, uh, every gender, every race, every ethnicity, uh, every religion around the world. Absolutely. On that note, we, we had another question from mm -hmm. an alum alumnus about diversity at Oxford and Cambridge. Yes. And in the past year, as in every year, that has been a matter of great controversy. Um, and both institutions have come under a lot of criticism for their failure to transform. Um, so I wonder if you have any thoughts on that mm -hmm. and what the role that Rhodes House plays in, in this context, given that we are embedded within um, the University of Oxford. Yes, no, absolutely. It's, I mean, there's been a lot, particularly within the UK context, there's been a lot of of um, criticism of Oxford and Cambridge, um, uh, some of which is, I, I, I would say, some of which is, is fair and some of which is very unfair, I, I, I think. Um, it, you know, some based in fact, some not based in fact. But it's an important issue. I think the, the, the nub of the issue that has been raised is 
uh, how diverse in particular the UK undergraduate population is and how many uh, uh, black students from Britain are getting into Oxford and Cambridge. So it's an important issue. It's one that um, I know in particular um, uh, quite a number of the colleges are working very hard on to change perceptions about Oxford Cambridge to build pipeline programs to um, expose more students to you know through summer programs and other kinds of programs who would not have um, uh, historically you know within their family nobody would have gone to Oxford or Cambridge and so to to make it clear that that uh, this is a university that wants more and more diversity in its undergraduate population so I think there's actually a lot of good efforts underway and there's actually good data being gathered and you know that's sometimes the first step and sometimes when you gather the data and make it public then people beat up on you and you know that's I suppose what happens in in these change efforts um, but I think there's some really good work that's happening uh, to try to diversify the undergraduate population. In our case, I think Rhodes is actually an incredibly wonderful way in, in which Oxford um, has for many years uh, been a very diverse place. And, uh, and I'm very proud of the ways in which from the growing number of African Americans, for example, in the U.S. Uh, Rhodes Scholar population, scholars of color all around uh, you know, across the globe. We've seen an increase in the number of Aboriginal and Indigenous scholars um, from Australia, uh, Canada, and uh, other places. So, uh, you know, we are also focused on that and, and thinking about how do we reach out to populations that have not traditionally had access to, um, to the Rhodes Scholarship. And so I think we can be kind of partners and allies of, of Oxford um, in, in this important effort. At the same time, the Rhodes Scholarships are seen as an elite institution in themselves, mm -hmm. perhaps the most elite scholarship in the world. And you've been appointed as warden at a moment in world history when the backlash against elitism and elite liberal institutions is greater than ever. Mm. So how do you think the Rhodes Trust can respond to that and perhaps mitigate that perception of the scholarship. Yes, yes. No, I think there's a really important distinction between elite and elitist. Um, I mean, I, 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 I see elitist institutions as uh, exclusionary, um, as, as very much defining themselves as, uh, you know, they're kind of narrowly who fits our, our, uh, our, our frame. Um, I think that there is great value in what you might call elite uh, education or elite opportunities um, and, and to the work of opening that up to talented young people from every background and, and you know, every part of the world. And I, I, I see that as, so I guess I'm sort of, I feel like Rhodes is un, unabashedly um, elite. You know, it is really hard to get a Rhodes scholarship. Um, it is, and I think will forever be, a merit scholarship. It's for those uh, students who have uh, great, uh, have demonstrated um, great uh, passion for, for their academic work and success in their academic work and leadership potential and, and character. And so that, you know, that's really powerful. And, and providing um, them with an opportunity to come together and work at the very highest levels um, uh, across different disciplines is, is valuable for then what it enables them to do, you know, um, in the, in the rest of their career. So elite but not elitist is, is, is the, is what I would see as the, as where we want to be and where, yes. where we try to be. And of course, sometimes, sometimes we need to counteract a stereotype. Um, there's still work to do, to do that, you know, to counteract a stereotype of, of the Rhodes Scholarship being elitist and not elite and, and open to anyone. In fact, our penultimate question is very closely related to that. Mm -hmm. And it, it's that there's still a belief in some constituencies that a Rhodes Scholar has to fit a very particular type of personality, mm -hmm. apart from academic achievement and an interest in effecting change, a Rhodes Scholar has to be confident, outgoing, sociable, ambitious, a particular kind of person. Um, what do you think we can do to change that attitude yes. and to encourage a wider range of personalities and candidates to feel comfortable applying? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I do think that 
Um, I mean, I, I encourage folks if they haven't to, if they haven't already done so, to go to the Rhodes website where there are these wonderful videos um, where current scholars uh, provide advice to applicants and prospective applicants about the whole process of considering applying, uh, applying, how does the interview work, you know, all of the different uh, phases of the application process. And one of the things that's really, I think, wonderful about those videos, and we have to continue to do this work, is that it breaks down some of those those stereotypes, you know, uh, Rhodes scholars are extroverts and introverts. They are, uh, you know, there's there's all kinds of personality types. Just as as you know, you can be an impactful leader in so you know with so many different kinds of personality types. Um, and I think it's important for us to find more and more ways through social media, through these kinds of videos, to uh, you know. And I think the most powerful tool is to have the voices of current Rhodes Scholars, who are incredibly diverse across all sorts of dimensions, for them to share their story. And I, I think that will be helpful to counteract that sense that you know, we, we fit a narrow mold. Because in fact, um, you know, Rhodes Scholars, I think, always have been of quite diverse personalities, um, but in particular, you know, are, are in increasingly so. And, and that's very important uh, for us to get that word out. Absolutely. So our last uh, prepared question yes. um, is that you once said that you believe higher education's mission is to not only foster but to prepare graduates to be good citizens, which makes moral education integral to our work. Yes. Uh, what does a moral education look like and how would you hope to integrate this into your work as warden? Yes, no, it's, it's a deep passion of mine. I feel like, you know, the at the very core of being an educated person is uh, to be someone who is um, uh, reflective about moral questions, um, about their own character, about their, their um, responsibilities towards others. And, and I really see that as core, I think it's always been at the core of the Rhodes Scholarship. It's been, you know, it's, it was in the selection criteria from the very beginning, you know, mm -hmm. that Rhodes Scholars needed to demonstrate um, sympathy for others and, uh, and kindness and, you know, these really wonderful virtues, uh, moral virtues. Uh, what has happened more recently, so, so in the selection process, you know, it's hard to, to you know, uh, to, to make sure that you're selecting people with those character traits, but that's a very important focus of what we do in, in the selection process and always have tried to do. Um, now we also are, through our character service leadership program, um, intentionally convening scholars and doing more work on, on ethics and leadership. And, uh, and I'm very excited about that. I think that, that the work that is happening is fantastic, and I'm interested in ways in which we might be able to further refine that and to, uh, uh, you know, to, to deepen the experience for scholars where it's, we're, we're constantly refining it and improving it on the basis of feedback you know, from, from every year from, from scholars. Uh, and then I'm also interested in ways in which Rhodes House can become, it already is, uh, a hub for that kind of thoughtful work on leadership and character on that's cross-cultural, cross-disciplinary. I'd love to see ways in which we can do it even more. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've, we have been working with other fellowship programs like the Schwartzman Scholars and the Atlantic uh, fellows um, and and uh, the Schmidt Science Fellows on that kind of work, but you know there I think over time there may be other ways in which uh, Rhodes can can do that work, and so I'm very excited to be a part of that, and to draw in alumni from around the world as we have done, you know, f uh, to to participate in that, to facilitate those conversations, to be a part of this community of people who sort of throughout their lives, ask themselves that question, you know, who am I, what do I stand for, how can I make a difference, you know, in, at this point in my life, how can I make the world a better place? So that to me is moral education and I'm very excited to be a part of it.
So we've reached the end of our questions, yes. but um, and we'll let you off the hook. Okay, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> thank you. Is there anything, any last things that you'd like to say to yeah. the alumni watching and also the many um, scholars in residence who must be watching too? Yes, well, first of all, I want to thank everybody who, uh, who tuned in to, to watch and listen to this live stream. I want to thank you, Saul and Aaron, your wonderful dialogue partners, and I really appreciate your being a part of this conversation. And uh, I, you know, I do want to mention we're going to be posting this on the web. So if people, you know, weren't able to tune in, they will be able to to watch it uh, afterwards. Um, and I just want to say to all of the the Rhodes alumni and current scholars, you know, who are listening, that as I mentioned, we are in this process of strategic planning and strategic visioning, building on the great work that's happened over the last five to ten years, and of course over the last 115 years, and thinking about where do we want the Rhodes Trust and the Rhodes Scholarship to be five years from now, 10 years from now. So we will be um, doing some, some draft plans and um, sharing them with uh, the entire global alumni community and as, as well as with all the scholars and residents. So I want to encourage people to watch for that. Probably early 2019 is when we will be uh, able to have a draft that's sufficiently kind of in good enough shape uh, to uh, to send out and then we'll be eager to get people's uh, feedback and suggestions but I've really appreciated everybody who asked sent in questions and uh, and I'm very excited about continuing to be in connection with the, this extraordinary global community and learning from all of you and working together to uh, make this amazing scholarship program uh, that has help to change the world, um, have it, its impact be even greater in the years to come. So thank you for joining us.